everybody, and welcome once again to the Real Comics Podcast. I'm your host, Felipe. Alongside me, as always, is my good friend and partner in crime, Andrew Gonzalez. Andrew, what's going on? Three, go three. That's right. This is part three of our Tricks or Treats event special. And we've got a good one for you today. Andrew, who are we hitting up today and what are we talking about? We are talking about From Hell. That's right. Alan We're going to talk Moore. about From Hell. Probably one of the darkest comic book movie reviews I think we're going to do. Um, this one's going to be pretty intense. But before we get into it really hardcore, let's talk about this real again. If you're joining us for the first time, we're going to try to give you a spoiler-free portion of our show. And then we're going to give you a spoiler portion of our show. We're going to delve into the comic book, the movie, and all the aspects of it. But we're going to get deep and heavy into it. So join us, if you will, for part three of our Tricks and Treats episode of From Hell. Inspector, I know your reputation for making brilliant guesses that turn out to be right. Someone told me you claim to dream the answers. All right, let's talk a little bit about the movie From Hell. From Hell came out in 2001. It was directed by the Hughes brothers, Albert and Alan Hughes, written by Alan Moore, who also did the graphic novel along with Eddie Campbell. All right, let's give you a little background. It's 198, or excuse me, it's 1888 in London, and the unfortunate poor lead horrifying lives. Mary Kelly and her small group of companions trudge through the life of daily misery, daily misery, only to be consoled by to see that things are getting worse. Luckily, they befriend a troubled but brilliant young detective played by Johnny Depp. That's right. In this film, we've got Johnny Depp as Inspector Frederick Aberdeen, Heather Graham as Mary Kelly, Ian Holm as Sir William Gull, Robbie Coltrane, a.k.a. Hagrid, better known as Sergeant Peter Godley, Ian Richardson as Sir Charles Warren, Jason Fleming, as Netley the Coachman, Catherine Ketrich as Dark and Annie Chapman. This is From Hell. So, Andrew, what are your impressions of the movie From Hell? I love From Hell. I'm the one that lobbied to get this disturbing ass flick on our list for this <laughs> month. Um, I am just intrigued by the whole mythology around this story. Um, I'll just leave it at that till we hit spoilers. Um, I like the look of the film. Um, I like that period in time. I find that that's an interesting time to tell the story, that time in London. Um, yeah, great cast, great everything. And the Hughes brothers, I'm a fan of them. So, yeah. I am definitely a fan of the Hughes brothers and like some of their past things. This movie is a bit more graphic. Uh, not a lot compared to today's stuff. I mean, for 2001. And I thought it was okay. I'm not going to say I loved it, but I did think it was okay. You're right. It, all the actors are are dead on point. They're great actors. We've seen them in many things. Um, we could go through the whole list, but, it, I mean, it'd be kind of ridiculous. They did a great job. And even Donny, Johnny Depp's performance is not a bad one. Heather Graham does really well. It's a period piece, so, of course, 1888 London looked beautiful. Um there's some moments in here that I did harken back to other films, but again, I don't want to talk about that either until we hit spoilers, which is a good thing, which is why I'm not totally discounting this film, but I do give it an eh, 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 eh from me on my film end. Yeah. I mean, I can see that. It's not the best from that era. Um, it's not even close to being the best Alan Moore um, adaptation of one of the books of one of his, I can't even talk. One of the best adaptations of one of his books. Um, you know, Watchmen is much better. V from Vendetta is much better. But yeah, it's a good, it's a good solid movie. It's a, it's a nice ha Halloween movie. Right. I give you that. <laughs> I give you that. It's got some some definite uh, horror tones in here for sure. Uh, the use of uh, light actually is really cool in a in, in a really good way without revealing too much of of what the plot points are and things like that. You you watch this group of ladies, you know, who meet up with this detective go through quite a bit and in determining why this is all happening to them in this part of London in Whitechapel. 
Um, that part was done really well. I've just, you know, you and I have just come off of doing a great review of uh, Blade Runner 2049. And I kind of feel that same sense that you might have had with that film. I have with this film. It's just not necessarily my thing, but I have mm -hmm. to say I did enjoy it. I also, one other thing, I think I caught it way back <laughs> just after, maybe on cable halfway through, and I didn't realize what it was. But in rewatching it just before the show, um, I kind of remembered it, uh, which helped mm -hmm. a little bit. Some of those things didn't seem so, you know, necessarily brand new. So it allowed me to think a little bit deeper. So Again, I give it a, a me. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> and I'm not a horror guy, and I like it, but it's about the mythology of it that probably makes it interesting to me. Yep. I'm a fan of that. Um, I will say it is a hard R. I'm going to yeah. throw that out there. Um, it's not for kids. Um, there are moments that may really um, offend you <laughs> in this movie, to say the least. So do come in understanding that this is a hard R. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely lends to exactly what you said. This is the perfect movie. And I'm glad you got it on here. Just because I didn't like outright enjoy it. This is the perfect Halloween movie to have on there when we're discussing the darker side of comic books. And speaking of that, what do you say we just go ahead and slide right on into our spoiler section and get deep into the comic and deeper into this film and the arc and kind of the subtext that this film has because it is really important. If it sounds like we're kind of skipping through this real quick, you kind of can't talk about the things you want to talk about without getting into spoilers in case you haven't seen this film. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, because, I mean, now's right. the time. Go rent it for Halloween. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's get into our spoiler section for From Hell. All right, Andrew. We've talked a little bit about how we feel about this. You really love this movie. I give it kind of a – it's a bubba meh. I've been saying meh. It's okay. I did enjoy watching this film. It's got some intriguing plot processes that I do enjoy, and we're going to talk about that too. But why don't you first, let's get into the quick history of the novel and Alan Moore. Talk to me a bit yeah, about him. Let's get quickly into Alan Moore. Alan Moore is notorious for writing um, a lot of comic books, his own, his own stuff when he was away from DC and Marvel, uh, that really challenge a lot of social things that are happening along. There's a lot of social commentary in his books. You know, we've heard of Watchmen, you've heard of V for Vendetta, where those are more political. There is a little bit of politics in this, but spoiler alert, now that we're here, it is about Jack the Ripper. And they do do their research and they do base a lot of the murders that happen in this book and then later the movie on real life murders. They were supposedly attributed to the Jack the Ripper. Um, so from that standpoint, this is why I like it, because I'm interested in Jack the Ripper. Uh, Moore and Campbell, they wrote this book um, between 89 and 98. There are 10 issues. Wow, there's there about 500 pages. Um, it's been put into a graphic novel now, and there's been more stuff added to it since. So you can get a hold of the graphic novel. It's black and white. If you're interested cool. in it, it, it plays more like a book than a comic, I would say. So that's why graphic novel is the right term for it versus trade, because this is more like a novel that has um, art to go along with it. Um, more notoriously um, hates his, the adaptations of his books and movies, and he won't have anything to do with them, and he won't watch them. So how much they deviated, it's hard to tell because he really didn't care. He kind of just casts the check and is like, he hates what they did to him. That's just his nature. He's kind of weird like that. Well, um, it's kind of disappointing because I thought there were a lot of shots that seemed that felt a little bit like panels from a comic book. Well, that that's the directors, just like right. You know, right. Zack Snyder taking panel shots in a Watchmen. There's no doubt about or it. Three hundred from Vendetta yeah. has the same ones. Well, three hundred is Frank Miller, but same but kind of guy. Frank yeah. Miller does this. Is very similar to Alan Moore. You know, you yeah. say, yeah, 300 Sin City. Um, cool. But yeah, Very so the comic cool. book, it really pulls from the Jack the Ripper story. So that makes it really interesting. Yeah, the whole plot of that stuff, and I, and we're going get, to get into that here in a little bit. It's a little bit further down on our mark list here. But um, that's probably what really kept me into the film and kept me above that, you know, giving it a really, you know, like I really didn't care for it. It, it did keep me intrigued. That's for darn sure. Hey, speak a little bit about the Hughes brothers. Uh, what do you think of them? I've always loved their stuff. I really, I really do. But what do you, what do you think? 
Um, yeah, I love the way they film things, and I think they brought a lot of this. Maybe isn't one of their better films, but yeah. they were at a point in their career where they could pick and choose what they wanted to do, and they they chose this. And I think they put the effort into it, but it doesn't quite, yeah, like you said, maybe hit the mark for everybody. But I think they did a great job. I love the look of the film. I look at how it's in darkness. I love the use of the color red. Yeah. Um, it's really used in kind of like a disturbing way at times. You know, whether it's part of a murder or part of, you know, just somebody eating some steak, you know, and the, and it transitions <laughs> into these like reds and you're just, whoa, you know, it's very disturbing and it stands I out. I don't think that was steak they were eating in this film. Just want to point that out. That was clearly uh, liver. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Human <laughs> liver. <laughs> Since we're in spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought they did a, a fairly good job. Um, one of my favorite moments that they that they seem to capture really well, and I'll talk about it now since we're talking about the way they film things. I love the way the steps of the coach come flapping out every time oh, yeah. they try to get one of the girls into the cat and in, into the the coach itself, or even anybody steps in. They just kind of they they just drop out. And I thought that was very ominous the way that they shot that uh, well, for sure. The stainless steel of the steps goes along with the stainless steel of the blade. Yep. That is the bad guy. So you see that a lot. Um, yeah. I, I just I just visually love the hell out of the film. It looks kind of like a comic book when they do the pan up of the skyline. Right. The city itself. Those look like they could be drawings from a comic book. Right. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, there were reds. There were shades of red even in the skyline itself with – Big Ben in the foreground. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I can totally see that. That leads to the look of the film and that whole Victorian era London. Yeah. What did you think about all that? I thought that I was thought, all done very well. Yeah, and that's what lends to the character of the movie. So you feel like you're in that timeline when Jack the Ripper um, was around, you know? And one of the things about the film is about this conspiracy theory, right? So right. They, one of the conspiracy theory things is it has to do with different um, landmarks in London. And they show us those. Part of the look, they show us these landmarks that are uniquely London, and right. I felt that not just landmarks, the street names, street yeah. names, Whitechapel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was Cleveland, mm -hmm. something else. There were others, yeah. And so I really liked the look. I looked at the costumes. The costumes looked authentic. The costumes of the unfortunates, i.e., the prostitutes, um, and then the the royalty, and then the gentlemen, and just different things. Just that whole look of that era. And like right. I said, I'm a big Jack the Ripper conspiracy fan. I love that and love Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type movie. So I was yep. you definitely You're definitely going to get that in here. That's why it's, you were spot on. Definitely a great Halloween flick, something to watch, especially if you haven't seen it before. Let's jump ahead just real quick. I want to bring up somebody and then tell me about what you think about this character because I, you know, I, uh, I'll give you my opinion after you give yours. Tell me a little bit about what you thought about Johnny Depp's version of this investigator who was a bit on the clairvoyant side due to the use of opium and things like that. Yeah. So there you get into something interesting. Is he on the clairvoyant side because of the opium? Right. Or is the opium a way that he kind of make, deals with this weird clairvoyance? So it kind of drove him to want to become a drug addict because if you constantly have these horrible visions in your mind, you kind of would make you want to just take drugs and fall asleep and not be there. And it's not just opium. He's constantly doing the, the absinthe, which right. had an opiate in it, the original absinthe. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. the drug use in this film, because not only Johnny Depp, the, our villain uh, also uses um, absinthe to, on his victims. So there's this yep. weird, makes the movie a little extra creepy. This movie's so freaking creepy. To, you know. <laughs> yeah, I won't look at grapes the same way again, that's for sure. Well, to me, that's why it's scary. You know, yeah. it's not scary in a traditional horror sense, but there's a lot of things about like old style medicine, the way that medicine was approached back then. Right. That are some creepy ass shit because you know they did that to people. Mm -hmm. And it's really frightening and scary and disturbing. Like when they yeah. give the character that lobotomy. And yeah, there's a lot of creepiness to this film. Just well, there's general. a there's a lot of factual people in here, and that's what I, you know, I, it's not necessarily part of our list, but I want to just touch on it real quickly because I'm afraid I'm going to forget. There's a there's a scene used with John Merrick is in here, uh, aka he's the Elephant Man. Yeah, he's on display. 
Um, there that we we are talking conspiracy theory. We're talking to the queen yeah. <laughs> and the prince of the queen, who are real people. Um, what did you think about all this use of factual things about all that stuff? Well, and that's what makes it so interesting and why yeah. I love it. And this isn't a who done it too. We kind of talked about that. Like right. I said, the plot was a bit predictable. In the yeah. book, they pretty much spell out who the bad guy is right off the bat. And you're going right. to know. this. You're, it's not meant to be um, like a big dun-dun-dun, you know, surprise. It's more about the fact that there's this conspiracy going on, and the people that know the truth just happen to be poor prostitutes that no one really cares about. So to get rid of them doesn't really bother most people. But this one detective who is trying to figure out what's going on and then you get into the Freemasons. That's introduced all over this. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. A whole other thing. And we know that's a real thing, too, that there really was right. the Freemasons. And, and so, of course, they're expounding on the mythology. No one knows exactly how, what they were like. Or the people that do are not talking about it, obviously. Um, right. So it just uh, that, that realness adds a creepy nature to it that um, – if this wasn't based on a real story, yeah, this movie would probably be like a kind of very average horror movie. So No, no, it, it, I think you're right there. But let's, you know, <laughs> those are some really good points and some really – so you're the – since you're the conspiracy theory person here and, and how all of this puts together, what do you think? Jack the Ripper, fact or fiction? I mean, where – where do the, the lines are so blurred in here, which does keep you involved in the movie. That's what I'm saying. That was my point of interest mm -hmm. that I started going, well, wait a minute. They're using all this. Could that possibly have been a reason? What do they know that I don't know? What did the, what did the comic book artists and, and creators of that know that I don't know? Yeah, what's interesting is they based a lot of this on a book by um, Stephen Knight. He's an um, English author, and he wrote this story that um, – Jack the Ripper was actually somebody who um, was an associate of the crown to the royal family. And the reason these prostitutes were killed is because the prince, the next in line to become the king, had had an affair with a prostitute and had a child, married her. She was Catholic, which is a huge deal because they were Protestant. So... Their child was the next heir after that from a prostitute, from a Catholic, from everything. So they dispatched um, the evil character, what's his name, Cole, to go out and remove all these witnesses. Right. From, right. So that, that we could never know that there was an heir. Right. And on top of it, the prince has syphilis, so he's not going to live anyway. Now, Moore has come out and said that he doesn't believe it's true. But he thought it was an awesome idea, and it was so close to possibly being true that it just intrigued the hell out of him that he just had to write this story. Well, that part of it's definitely amazing, and that's again, that's that's the part I did like about this film. That whole the thought process that would they really go that far? Would the queen and the monarchy go that far to keep uh, what they would consider not a child out of royal blood? away from the crown and possibly even dead itself if they could find it. Yeah, and not just the crown, but the the people, the gentlemen that are part of the Freemasons. Right. Who are, in essence, the most important people there in London, who are the shock callers, who are the wealthy, the influential, that all of them would turn a blind eye, all of them aware, because it was one of their own who was slicing people and murdering people who was Jack the Ripper, and that's why he couldn't be caught because – Everybody knew, and then the fact that this, the Jack the Ripper just suddenly stopped, because that's fact. That did. He just suddenly stopped. And it's because the task was accomplished. Right. All these women were killed that needed to be killed. And so after that, there's no purpose to him. So either they got rid of him, they locked him up, they killed him. In the, in the movie slash book, they give him a lobotomy. So Right. Interesting. Oh, so many questions are being availed right now. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, let's jump over to uh, Robbie Coltrane, uh, a.k.a. Hagrid, and his character in this <laughs> film. He was probably my favorite character in this film. Uh, I love the way he spoke and the way he dealt with Johnny Depp's character. Um, but why don't you tell me a little bit about what you thought about uh, Robbie Coltrane's character, and then I'm going to give you a little comparison that I really enjoyed. Yeah. 
I feel like he's the only normal guy in the whole damn thing. You know, <laughs> that, what I mean? that's what I was going to say. <laughs> guy doing his job, and he has to deal with who he really cares about. He cares about Johnny Depp's character, but he has to go pull him out of opium dens. He has to put him to work. He just wants his friend to be happy, and you know, do these. But he has, and then he has to deal with all these ghastly murders. And he just wants to like, okay, let's just get this done so we can go have lunch or go have a drink or be done with this shit. Right. And yeah. you, your partner is this guy that just has to poke and poke and poke <laughs> and go to places that Coltrane's character knows that things aren't going to end good. You're, you're challenging right. authorities that we're we're in some deep duty if we go there. So. I really, really enjoyed uh, his character on screen. That was something I really did like about the film as well. Um, I got to tell you, though, I, it was hard for me not to think, and, and it, like I said, I hope it doesn't offend you when I say it, it was hard not to think Sherlock Holmes and Watson um, to me. No, uh, I, I get that. a lot of similarities there. I get a lot of similarities there, and I think that's why I enjoyed it. One of my favorite relationships in either in either books or film has always been uh, Sherlock Holmes and Watson, um, mm -hmm. because they're so vastly different. Yet they have to be friends. They have to be in order to form a cohesive team and get things done. So no matter whose portrayal of it, they've always had that really intense relationship. And I thought that it kind of showed here. So it I thought there. that a lot. It was yeah. there. I would. I, I didn't think about it much, but as you pointed out, it was obviously there. That that duo. He is very Sherlock Holmesy. Um, <laughs> Holmesy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's a Sherlock. <laughs> and he's a um, Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. So yeah, it was really well done. Uh, my favorite person in it was actually um, the character of Mary Kelly, played by um, Heather Graham. Heather Graham. I thought she did a really good job. She, you know, she's not English, and she did a good job of playing an English woman and and she's like the only maybe she's not innocent per se but she represents something that um the books talk about is she is the in, the powerful woman and this book is about masculinity putting down women that's that's the biggest thing that more wanted to talk about so the fact that she survives and makes it to the end and kind of wins in essence is a powerful message and so i really enjoyed her character telling that story so. yeah let's keep that in mind here too that you know you pointed that out and that goes to your hard r it's just not blood and guts which is the, mm -hmm. which is heavy in this film there's a lot of uh strong just blatant sexual contact because they were Vulgarity. prostitutes the, they're vulgar in their own you know british english way whatever you want to call it well it's street um, it's very street it's yeah very it's very street yeah. And that's to kind of show that juxtaposition between them and the, quote, learned men, the proper gentlemen who are physicians and they're, they're, they're scholars and all that, that the Freemasons are. They're proper, yet they're evil as fuck. You know what I mean? So right. the bad guys are the elite in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about Robbie Coltrane, Johnny Depp, Heather Graham. Uh, let's talk about Ian Holmes' character. Oh, man. He's a creepy what fucker. It, yeah. You know, it's funny. I got to say this real quick before I let you go to town. All I could think, you know how I, I associate certain images and things on screen, like I just mm -hmm. compared Sherlock Holmes. I, all I could think about was when you, when you watch Ian Holmes turn, especially towards the end of this film, mm -hmm. I have thought of that moment in the first Lord of the Rings or which was yeah. it the first one when, the, when he wants the yeah. ring back, when he wants the ring it back the and he one. turns to Frodo and does that little <laughs> like that. And yeah. I was like, Holy crap. He, that's one evil looking dude when he needs to be. Talk to me about Ian Holm as the monster of this film. You know, that funny thing was, so that one is the hardest thing for me to still figure out. So was he actually a monster? Was it more where, until that point, you just think he's insane. Right. Okay. And he's doing these things that the book, they kind of portray it is that he goes insane in the process of doing these murders. He doesn't start out insane. He's been asked to do this and he's doing it. But as he continues to murder these women, he, he loses it. So by the end, he's insane. This movie didn't really do it that way. It made me think like he was insane the whole time, and maybe he had a he really was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the way he made that turn from the scholarly gentleman who's basically 
spelling out who the murderer is, even though it's him, to Johnny Depp, because they have like these yeah. interactions and they have these interviews. Well, it would have to be someone who could do this. Like Johnny Depp has other ideas that would throw his scent off of him, but instead of like going along with that, he goes, no, nah, it's someone like this who's basically someone me. Right. He's the one person you think you can trust, and in reality, he's the monster. Mm -hmm. And his interactions with his coach driver are actually very frightening because the coach driver is just a kind of simple, yeah. not very smart guy, and he has to become complicit in all these awful murders. Yeah. So between what I didn't like, speaking of that too, the coach lights, the green coach lights make me think of like headless horsemen and things like yeah. that. It just that that era, that look, you know. <laughs> and I was like, here comes the bad guy. Here comes the yeah. bad guy. Better watch out. We don't know who it is yet. No, that was that was good. But you're right. He when his eyes turned, mm -hmm. I didn't catch that right away. I'm like, he doesn't have regular eyes. All of a sudden, there are these dark saucers, and he's mm -hmm. sitting back there like a dark elf or some crap. That's why I thought about the Lord of the Rings that when he jumped and he turned wanting that ring back, same kind of moment, same kind of feel. Yeah. <laughs> and then the fact that now his hand works, that hand that doesn't work. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that too. You just jumped into my next question. So, cause that was the one question that didn't. So what was reality? See, that's where I got con kind of confused. And this is where that's I kind of think get into who? where I did go into that fantasy of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that he does become a different person at that. So point. is his hand working or not? We don't know. It, I think it is. I think he can't pre perform that stuff with just one hand. So I think his right. hand does. And I think it's because he becomes another person and you get into some schizophrenia things, multiple personality debates on how real or unreal like of people having those the actual different mannerisms and strength like split was a great right. example that you have these different yeah. things when you're the different personality um yeah well, so i like he, that well he clearly yeah. loses himself he definitely clearly loses himself especially in that moment towards the end of the last killing when he's got that heart in his hand and he's he's imagining that all these scholars are listening to what he has to say about the anatomy uh, of mm -hmm. someone's body and what the heart can do and what it's made up of and all these things and they're clapping and cheering he has that it's like a breakdown a mental breakdown of oh, him yeah. being you know so yeah he's definitely yeah maybe he is split <laughs> yeah but at that point he's insane when they're they're passing verdict on him and he's like no you people are not worthy to pass verdict on me and stuff so yeah by then but they're all complicit that's right the story the fact that they're all complicit and even the queen who just says, I don't want to hear anything else about it. It's done. Well, we'll move on. And I never want to hear about it again, but she's part, of, you know, Johnny Depp's boss is part of the Freemasons. And, and right. I don't know how much you paid attention early on. You could see the pin on his tie. Very, yeah, you very can see early. It. You can see it on the tie. I knew I, I could also, that's why I thought this was a bit predictable, even though I didn't read the comic you did, or the, I should mm -hmm. say graphic novel, um, to where you, you're outright told. I Me, mean, I'm picking it apart. So I could mm -hmm. see on the map when he's starting to draw out where the murders were taking place. I'm like, that looks like, you know, the symbols for mm -hmm. the Freemasons and that mm -hmm. five-pointed star and such, you know, that whole deal. So, yeah, for sure. Definitely. So from a traditional movie sense, I could see how people didn't like it. Like, well, this is a duh. I figured it out. Duh. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. if you don't realize that this isn't just a Hollywood depiction, that at least half of these murders – are being done and staged on how they probably happened. Right. And definitely the part where they're finding the bodies, this is how they found these bodies. This is what they look like. This was the part of body that was removed at that time. So again, oh. that to me goes to a creepy. Whenever there's real, <laughs> like I'll give you an example, the Amityville horror movie. To right. me is more creepy than Halloween or- Because or it's based in fact. Just the fact that there's a real house and these people yeah. claim shit happened there. That scares the piss out of me. You know? <laughs> the exorcist that it supposedly no. happens, even though I you tell know, people all the time the entity, watch the entity based <laughs> on a true story of a possessed woman. Watch that. That's a scary ass shit. <laughs> yeah. but, but we digress, but we digress for sure. Okay. So, Andrew, is there anything else that you think that we need to touch on a bit more or, or cover? I think we've touched on a lot of little things, yeah. but. I hope we're covering the spectrum here because, you know. I think we have. I think we've given it its justice. It's a very simple film. It's, it's, this is not it is. There's a lot of deep thought. I mean, 
the possibility of the conspiracy is something you're just going to have to decide on your own as you watch it, as they tell the story. It may spark you to go read a couple things. It might spark you to read um, Mr. Knight's book, um, yeah. which is a really well done book about that conspiracy. Um, yeah. And he also wrote another book about the Freemasons and you might want to just go off the deep end and then you'll really be all freaked out. <laughs> but um, Okay. So you're saying all that, but before we close, I can't get away without asking you this. Since you're the aficionado, since you've touched into this world at least a little bit, is Jack the Ripper, was Jack the Ripper, is he dead? Is he gone? Or is he still around? Still around now? <laughs> yeah. He'd be an old man. Have you He'd not, have have you not seen America. it? Well, I mean, not necessarily still around, but made it to America, gone on, done other um, things. I've seen that TV show. I've watched a couple of them. They were interesting, not enough to grab me completely. But do you think that he could have decide if he was doing yeah. a job or he was insane? If he yeah. was doing the job, they may have finished. He may have finished the job and just moved on, and he just lived out his life, never doing the murders again. Like say he was a soldier or something like that. Right. Like the theory, there's a. They kind of try to swerve you that it could be this guy who's a, a field medic who was in the mm -hmm. army. So right. if it was someone like that, then maybe that just did a job and they're just that kind of cold-hearted person. Right. If it was an insane person, you think they would have locked him up. But he was probably somebody that would have caused great embarrassment to somebody's family. So therefore, was hush-hushed. And right. they were just kind of quietly tucked away somewhere. Well, I have to admit, of all the theories that I've heard about this particular story, this one seems the most plausible, I hate to say. Um, that's dark. That's some dark stuff, man. And I'm glad yeah. we got to do this. So let, thank you, Andrew, for making sure this one made it into the fold. Wow. Uh, all right. Any final closing thoughts before we say goodbye on this part three? Yeah, I say you should go watch it. I mean, it's, it's perfect for Halloween. You can rent it. It's on Cinemax right now too. If you have Cinemax, just put it on and check it out. Uh, like I said, hard R. Um, the, some women may be very offended by the vulgarity because they're prostitutes in an era when things were pretty vulgar. <laughs> yeah. So, Unfortunately, they didn't matter much. I, I hate yeah. to say. So definitely, I would say the same thing. We always say that here on the show, make sure you watch it. If you've never seen from hell, give it a watch again, my side of it. I didn't think it was amazing, but it was enjoyable and definitely intriguing with the plot points we just discussed, but give it a watch. Also, seek out the, the graphic novel. It's only one book, so there's not a big investment. You can get it digitally on Comixology. You can get it probably through Amazon or anyone else. Um, you can read it. That might be a little more interesting read versus a watch if you're into that as well. So, Or maybe even the theory book. What was that again? Uh, can you still uh, have I don't that know right the there? Name close the book, but Stephen Knight is the one who wrote the book on Jack the Ripper. It's called, and his theory was about the murders of how it happened, yeah. Oh, and then a little thing I forgot to say. From Hell is taken actually from the letter. There were some letters that were written to the police department. They kind of show it briefly in the movie. You see yeah, they do. They touch letter? on it. They're like, they're like the, somebody crazy did it. There was a real letter that somebody said from Hell hmm. that they got that they thought might be a real one versus all the hoaxy ones that they were getting. So that's where the title From Hell comes from. Hey, that's a good point. I like it. I like it a lot. All right there, Andrew. Well, this has been part three of our Tricks and Treats series. Uh, and I think this was a really good one for us to do. So I'm glad you did it. The darker side of comic books. It's our Halloween event. I'm glad we're doing it. Hey, what's next on tap for our Halloween event? Let's tease that one. Ah, uh, uh, the next movie to me is probably one of the top five best comic book movies ever made. Wow, Man. that's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. You're not going to tell them? You're not going to tell them what it is? Nah, sorry. You got to wait. <laughs> but it's going to be a double feature. Let's tease that. Yes. It'll be a double feature for you. The next episode, Chapter 4, will be out next week. So listen for it. But until then, Andrew, how can they reach you if they want to hit you up on the Twitter sphere? They can hit me at Real Comics, R E E L C O M I C S. That's right. If you want to talk to me on the Twitter sphere, follow me or send me a question at voodoo underscore 57. If you want to talk to either of us, look for our podcast Twitter feed, and that's at real, R-E-E-L underscore 
podcast. Andrew, good job, buddy. Until the next one, see you later. Yeah, you'll see me eventually. <laughs> For sure. The Halloween event continues. We'll see you next week right here on the Real Comics Podcast. And don't forget, always be your own hero. Thank you.